Let me start with just a couple of portraits of Michel Foucault. Um, this is the way I think most of us think of Foucault, relaxed, confident, um, a man in the peak of his uh, powers. Um, this one too. Um, this is an older Foucault. I don't know when it was taken, but it, he looks considerably older. He died when he was 58, um, so this may, must have been quite close to the end of his life. My favourite image of Foucault, though, is this one, the only image of Foucault that's known to me that, in which he has hair. <laughs> and the uh, French inscription says, um, um, there are doubtless some um, more people than just me who write in order not to have a face. Um, I'll leave that for what it's worth. Uh, Foucault was born in 1942 in Poitiers, um, the son of um, upper-middle-class parents. He attended the École Normale Supérieure from 1946, initially studying psychology, um, Heideggerian psychology, particularly the work of Binswanger. Um, he published um, his first book in 1954, a book, a book called Maladie Mentale et Personnalité, um, a book which he later disowned. It was a, a false start to his intellectual career. After a series of teaching positions in Uppsala, uh, Warsaw and Hamburg, Foucault re returned to France in 1960 and published his doctoral dissertation um, in French called Folie et des raisons. Um, in English it's usually translated madness and civilization. Um, a whole range of subse subsequent publications of which these are the most important. There are a couple of other published books um, during his lifetime. Posthumously the transcripts of Foucault's lectures at, at the Collège de, de France, where he was appointed Professor of the History of Systems of Thought in 1970, have been published in a series of volumes which bridge the gap between Volume 1 and Volumes 2 and 3 of the History of Sexuality and develop a theory of the different modalities of power in modernity, modalities which he calls respectively sovereignty, discipline and governmentality. Um, to date, the following volumes have been published, um, Psychiatric Power, Abnormal, Society Must Be Defended, Security, Territory, Population, The Hermeneutics of the Subject, and The Birth of Biopolitics, and there are a further seven volumes in preparation. In addition, there have been a number of volumes collecting Foucault's occasional writings and interviews. So he was like many French intellectuals of his generation, extraordinarily prolific. Um, uh, friends of mine who've worked in the Bibliothèque Nationale speak of Foucault sitting at his desk for 12 hours a day, day after day after day, reading, taking notes. Um, he obviously devoted himself full time to his work. Uh, Foucault d died of an AIDS-related illness in 1984. I'm going to focus tonight on three books, Madness and Civilization, Discipline and Punish, and the first volume of The History of Sexuality, and I'll also look briefly at Foucault's theorization of subjectivity. My initial puzzle, it's a puzzle for everyone, is what it, exactly is it that Foucault does? Um, historians almost unanimously disown him. Um, um, he's not a philosopher in any conventional understanding of that word. And the word um, theorist, I think, it, I mean, we use it to, de to describe his kind of work, but in a sense it's a cop-out. Um, it's the label that you give something that you can't find a, a more appropriate label for. We might say that Foucault was a historian not of ideas, but of what he calls knowledges in the plural or more precisely, of the conditions under which truth happens. And to that extent, his work is philosophical, if not in any way that's uh, recognisable to contemporary philosophers. Foucault was influenced by um, a number of historians of, of science, including Georges Canguillem and Gaston Bachelard, uh, and by his friend and teacher, the Marxist theorist Louis Althusser, and in a general way by the Annal school of uh, French historians, uh, a school which rethought the, the, the writing of history in terms of questions of 
what they called long duration, questions of continuity and discontinuity over large stretches of time, um, and emphasised structural issues of demography, climate, trade, the growth of cities, and so on, rather than political events and personages. There are two major stylistic modes which characterise Foucault's work. The first one, and I'm going to give an extended demonstration in a moment, um, is a dramatic um, rhetoric. Um, Foucault's books contain a number of great set pieces. Um, the account of the ship of fools that begins Madness and Civilization. Um, the account of Velázquez paint, painting Las Meninas, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, the death of Damien, which begins Discipline and Punish. Um, the account of Bentham's Panopticon. And again, I'll talk about that later. Um, they reflect the more literary dimension of Foucault's work. He always thinks of himself first and foremost as, uh, as a writer. This is Velázquez Las Meninas, probably familiar to most of you, um, painted in 1656 um, uh, by uh, Velázquez, um, commissioned by the royal uh, family of, the, of, of Spain. Um, Foucault begins um, the book The Order of Things with an extended reading of this painting. Um, and I'm going to reproduce um, some, of that, some of that reading. He begins with an exhaustive account of the personae um, represented here. The Infanta Margarita in the middle, um, her attendants um, at the court of her parents, the, uh, King Philip IV and his wife Mariana, a pet dog, the painter, it's a self-portrait of Velasquez. The passing visitor, positioned at a threshold in the door, either leaving or entering, it's not clear which. More importantly, Foucault reads the lines of force created by the intersecting gazes of the represented figures and their interaction with the invisible space at which the painter looks and from which we view the painting. Um, the painter stands beside his huge easel, which both contains and conceals from us the picture that he's painting. We see him at this moment of hesitation, brush in hand. But, Foucault writes, when in a moment he makes a step to the right, removing him, himself from our gaze, he'll, he will be standing exactly in front of the canvas he is painting. He will enter that region where his painting, neglected for an instant, will for him become visible once more free of shadow and free of reticence, as though the painter could not at the same time be seen on the picture where he is represented and also see that upon which he is representing something. He rules at the threshold of these two incompatible visibilities. The gaze of this painter is directed towards a point which is invisible but which we can identify since, as Foucault says, it is we ourselves who are that point our bodies, our faces, our eyes. The spectacle he is observing is thus doubly invisible. First, because it's not represented within the space of the painting, and second, because it's situated precisely in that blind point, in that essential hiding place into which our gaze disappears from ourselves at the moment of our actually looking. We can, we can guess at what's on the canvas, of which we perceive only the back, but this opacity quote, reconstitutes in the form of a surface the invisibility in depth of what the artist is observing, that space in which we are and which we are. The gaze of the painter thus runs from within represented space to a real external space, reaching out to include us and to link us to the representation of the picture. But this inclusion is deceptive. It occurs only because we happen to occupy the space of the subject that Velasquez is painting. Yet we double that subject. The painter's gaze absorbs the counter gaze of whoever is looking at, at this painting. And in this sense, quote, no gaze is stable, or rather in the neutral furrow of the gaze piercing at a right angle through the canvas, subject and object, the spectator and the model reverse their roles to infinity. The spectator's invisibility is made visible to the painter and transposed into an image forever invisible to himself. Foucault then turns his attention 
to what he calls a marginal trap, the light streaming in through a window at the right of the painting, which bathes both the space we are looking at and the real volume occupied by the spectator. This extreme, partial, scarcely indicated window, he writes, frees a whole flow of daylight which serves as, as the common locus of the representation. It balances the invisible canvas on the other side of the picture, just as that canvas, by turning its back to the spectators, folds itself in against the picture representing it and forms by the superimposition of its reverse and visible side upon the surface of the picture depicting it, the ground inaccessible to us on which there shimmers the image par excellence. So does the window, a pure aperture, establish a space as manifest as the other is hidden as much the common ground of painter, figures, models and spectators as the other is solitary, for no one is looking at it, not even the painter. From the right there streams in through an invisible window the pure volume of a light that renders all representation visible. To the left extends a surface that conceals on the other side of its all too visible woven texture the representation it bears. The canvas is thus, is thus like a mirror of which we can see only the back. But as it happens, we can see that at the rear of the room, amongst a number of hanging canvases, all of which have been precisely identified by art historians, of course, um, there is one, he says, that shines with particular brightness. Its frame is wider and darker than those of the others, yet there is a fine white line around its inner edge, diffusing over its whole surface a light whose source is not easy to determine, for it comes from nowhere unless it be from a space within itself. In this strange light appear two silhouettes, and we recognise that this isn't a picture, it's a mirror. It offers us, offers us at last that enchantment of the double that until now has been denied us. This mirror reflects nothing that is in the space we can see, a space filled with the figures of the painter, the infanta and so on, Rather, Foucault says, it provides a metathesis of visibility, that is, a, a statement about the nature of visibility itself, that affects both the space represented in the picture and its nature as representation. It allows us to see in the centre of the canvas what in the painting is of necessity doubly invisible. These two silhouettes are those of the king and his queen. But Foucault says giving them, giving them their proper names is an artifice because of the irreducibility of the space where one speaks to the space where one looks. Because, that is, language and the image are never equivalent forms of representation. We, we must therefore, he writes, pretend not to know who is to be reflected, reflected in the depths of that mirror and interrogate that reflection in its own terms. He then proceeds to a lengthy analysis of the relation between the mirror and the canvas that is concealed from us, before moving on to consider the figure who stands in the open doorway um, next to the mirror and acts as a kind of counterpoint to it. An ambiguous figure, it's actually been identified as Velasquez's nephew, um, which, quote, repeats on the spot, but in the dark reality of his body, the instantaneous movement of those images flashing across the room, plunging into the mirror, being reflected there and springing out from it again like visible, new and identical species. Pale, minuscule, those silhouetted figures in the mirror are challenged by the tall, solid stature of the man appearing in the doorway. In this spiral of representations, the central place is occupied by the Infanta Margarita. In one sense, she is merely an onlooker to the real painting on the hidden canvas, but in another sense, she is, in fact, the real object of representation, the centre of a network of gazes that play around her in a chiasmic pattern. The painting thus plays with the relation between that which is outside represent, rep represented space and which appears merely as a ghostly, ghostly reflection in the mirror and the represented space of the picture we are looking at, which in turn opens out to that outside. The paradox is that, quote, the face reflected in the mirror is also the face that is contemplating it. What all the fig figures in the picture are looking at are the two figures to whose, whose eyes they too present a scene to be observed. These figures are the two sovereigns, but 
in the midst of all those attentive faces, all those richly dressed bodies, they are the palest, the most unreal, the most compromised of all the painting's images. A movement, a little light would be sufficient to eclipse them. Of all these figures represented before us, they are also the most ignored, since no one is paying the slightest attention to that reflection which has slipped into the room behind them all, silent, si silently occupying its unsuspected space. In so far as they are visible, they are the frailest and the most distant form of all reality. Inversely, insofar as they stand outside the picture and are therefore withdrawn from it in an essential invisibility, they provide the centre around which the entire representation is ordered. This centre fulfils a triple function in relation to the picture, since, quote, in it there occurs an exact, exact superimposition of the model's gaze as it's being painted, that is the king and the queen, of the spectators as he contemplates the painting, this painting, and of the painters as he is composing his picture, not the picture um, being represented, but the, the one in front of us which we're discussing. These three observing functions come together in a point exterior to the picture, that is, an ideal point in relation to what is represented, but a perfectly real one too, since it's also the starting point that makes the representation possible. On the one hand, then, the picture represents the completed cycle of representation. On the other, however, the lines that run through the depth of the picture are not complete. They all lack a segment of their trajectories. This gap is caused by the absence of the king, an absence that is an artifice on the part of the painter. But this artifice both conceals and indicates another vacancy, which is, on the contrary, immediate, that of the painter and the spectator when they are looking at or composing the picture. It may be that in this picture, as in all the representations of which it is, as it were, the manifest essence, the profound invisibility of what one sees is inseparable from the invisibility of the person seeing, despite all mirrors, reflections, imitations and portraits. Around the scene are arranged all the signs and successive forms of representation, but the double relation of the representation to its model and to its sovereign, to its author as well as to the person to whom it is being offered, uh, this relation is necessarily interrupted. It can never be present without some residuum, even in a representation that offers itself as a spectacle. In the depth that traverses the picture, hollowing it into a fictitious recess, and projecting it forward in front of itself, it is not possible for the pure felicity of the image ever to, ever to present in the full light both the master who is representing and the sovereign who is being represented. Perhaps, uh, says Foucault in conclusion, there exists in this painting by Velasquez the representation, as it were, of classical representation and the de definition of the space it opens up to us a mode of representation which is built around a void, the necessary disappearance of that which is its foundation, of the person it resembles and the person in whose eyes it is only a resemblance. This very subject, which is the same, has been elided, and representation, freed fin finally from the relation that was impeding it, can offer itself as representation in its pure form. I'm sorry to have quoted such a dense analysis at such length, but I, did, I wanted to give you a, a feel for the kind of rhetoric that Foucault uses. Uh, what he does with this um, analysis is then move on to um, a series of analyses of successive modes and typologies of representation and of the metaphorical structures on which they are built, ways of knowing that he calls epistemes, um, and which he traces from the 17th century through to the present. I said that there are two major rhetorics characterising Foucault's work. The other is an analytic uh, rhetoric, a reading of social formations as though they weren't coherent and real entities, but rather contingent assemblages. I'll give a number of examples of this, of this rhetoric further on in this talk. These two rhetorics, um, I'm generalising wildly now, correspond to two rather different political impulses. The first, um, which is more characteristic of Foucault's early work, although it, it never 
um, finally disappears. The first is a kind of Nietzschean political romanticism, which values transgression, the breaking of norms, the socially outcast. The other is more detached. It's built around the critique of liberalism and the analysis of modernity as a distinctive set of power formations. But it doesn't assume that state power and modern forms of discipline and control can simply be transcended. It assumes that we're always within power and that power is always met by counterpowers. In this second mode, we can detect, I think, the influence of Foucault's teacher and colleague, uh, Louis Althusser, not the Althusser of a, of a systematic reading of Marx, but the Althusser who seeks to define what counts as knowledge and what doesn't in particular social um, circumstances. And the Althusser who seeks, in opposition to traditional Marxist accounts of a top-down power founded in the economic infrastructure and the corresponding class structure, um, who seeks to model complexity through such concepts as overdetermination and the decentered structure, the so-called structure in dominance of the social formation. Foucault's project is different, but it's related. It's not normative, but rather describes structures of normativity, those norms which determine what counts historically as real knowledge. One of his most telling examples is that of Mendelian biology. Um, um, which was, of course, unrecognised and unaccepted in Mendel's own lifetime. Um, it was, as we now see, true, but it wasn't, Foucault says, in the true. That is, it wasn't recognisable as a workable truth within the regime of 19th century scientific knowledge. What this means, then, is that the history of science must be a history um, not of discoveries, not of truths, but rather of systems of thought, the structures that govern the emergence and the valency of truth. But knowledge isn't quite the right term for what Foucault seeks to describe. The term in his work is always understood, rather, um, as, as coupled with power. The object of Foucault's thought is always power slash knowledge, a single entity meaning there is no knowledge that can be separated from the effects of power with which it's intric intricately interwoven, and there is no power which doesn't mobilise a knowledge or a set of knowledges. Ways of acting on the world are always bound up with ways of knowing it. The American philosopher John Reichman says somewhere that Foucault writes and thinks in clusters of four at the level of the sentence or at the level of the analysis of structures. This sounds sillier than it actually is. What I think he means is that Foucault refuses the one of religious or platonic idealism. He refuses the two of Cartesian dualism. And he refuses the three of the Hegelian dialectic. The figure four in his work this figure which is acted out in every sentence of Foucault's work, um, stands for multiplicity, for open-ended systems. Deleuze indeed called Foucault the preeminent thinker of multiplicity. Um, there's an inherent paradox here, though, since the number four can, of course, form a closed and symmetrical system. And often in Foucault, this kind of schematism can seem to be in place, existing in tension with the thinking of the open and the multiple. There's a similar tension between those concepts in Foucault, particularly that of the episteme in the order of things that set up closed structural models and other concepts that seek to work out ways of thinking, um, ways of thinking about shifting configurations of heterogeneous factors. Let me give two examples of such concepts. The first is the concept of the dispositif, um, it's a hard word to translate, usually translated as something like apparatus in English. Um, what Foucault means by it is a way of modelling ontological heterogeneity in a contingent and transient structure, a structure that may be made up of technical instruments. Uh, um, I'm talking now about Foucault's analysis 
of the, the clinical gaze, the, the birth of modern medicine and the, the kind of scrutiny that goes with it, it, it made up then of technical instruments, medical authority, an evolving scientific discourse, the architecture of the laboratory or the hospital um, or the teaching auditorium, and changing concepts of bodily tissue. All of these things contribute to the formation of that gaze. Foucault defines the, the dispositif as follows. It is, he says, a thoroughly heterogeneous ensemble consisting of discourses, institutions, architectural forms, regulatory decisions, laws, administrative measures, scientific statements, philosophical, moral and philanthropic propositions. In short, the said as much as the unsaid. The apparatus itself is the system of relations that can be established between these elements. A similar kind of work is done by the concept of the discourse formation. It's a term that allows Foucault to move away from a structuralist model of discourse as the system of language and its use by speakers towards a way of thinking in which grammar, social relations, the schooling system, a physical and, and social environment, modes of authority and so on all work as complex assemblages to shape the organisation of meaning and truth. I want now to define in the most abstract terms the key areas in which Foucault works. At the most general level, his work can be understood as an analysis of what he calls biopower or biopolitics. That is, the control of populations, a term which, he says, emerges and is understood from the late Renaissance on as a unitary entity for which the sovereign has responsibility and which he seeks to shape and discipline. Biopower contrasts with traditional modes of power based on the threat of death from a sovereign. In an era, he says, where power must be justified rationally, biopower is characterised by an emphasis on the protection of life rather than the threat of death, on the regulation of the body and the production of other technologies of power, such as the notion of sexuality. Regulation of customs, habits, health, reproductive practices, family, blood and well-being would be straightforward examples of biopower, as would any conception of the state as a body and the use of state power as essential to its life. Hence the conceived relationship between biopower, eugenics and state racism. A typical mode of operation of this form of power would be the development of systems of mass inoculation in the 18th century or the building of sewage systems as measures of public hygiene in the major cities of the 19th century. But it extends beyond such systems to the structure of power that Foucault calls discipline and to the mode of governance based on statistical demographic measurement and centralised regimes of control of populations that he calls governmentality. The shift from a regime of sovereignty to one based on the governance of populations is dramatically exemplified at the beginning of Discipline and Punish, um, which describes the death in 1757 of the regicide uh, Damien. Damien was first uh, tortured with red-hot pincers. His hand, holding the knife used in the attempted assassination, uh, was burned using sulphur. Molten wax, lead and boiling oil were poured into his wounds. Horses were then harnessed to his arms and legs for his, dismem mem his dismemberment. Damien's limbs and ligaments, however, did not separate easily. So after some hours, representatives, representatives of the parliament ordered the executioner and his aides to cut his, joint, his joints. Damien was then dismembered and his torso, apparently still living, was burnt at the stake. <laughs> The point of Foucault's long and vivid description of this death is the public visibility of the punishment and its infliction on the body of the offender. The regime of discipline that gradually displaces that of sovereignty and which is bound up with liberal notions of the care of the soul, themselves in inherited from Christian modes of pastoral governance, controls bodies only in order to rehabilitate the prisoner educate the student, train the soldier, 
or adapt the worker to his employment.